Hello, thank you for tuning in to the Casually Molly podcast. This is your host, Molly Amberkey. Just wanted to remind you that we are in partnership with With Love. With Love is a handcrafted bath and body company based in St. Louis, Missouri. Founded by hubby and wife dynamic duo Stephen and Kendra Hunt in November 2016, they initially wanted to make natural products for their family to use, but God had a bigger plan. Commercial products and the uncertainty of everything that was in the household. They decided to formulate their own products with items right in the kitchen. They made a post on social media about the products they were making, and the community started to inquire. Here they are today. Just remember that you can follow With Love on Facebook and Instagram. Have you ever wanted to get your shit together? Scrap it, look through the lens and capture it. But first world problems are getting you down. Disabled, salty, need an app to fix that frown. <laughs> well, you can do all those things and so much more. Just grab a seat in the chair with the floor. Sit back, relax, recline. While she drops another casual line. You're tuned in to Casually Molly with Molly. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Casually Molly podcast. I am your host, Molly Ambergy. Uh, normally I'm in the city, but I'm actually quarantined with my boyfriend here in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, welcome, Rafe Williams, the best gilf in town. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? How are you surviving quarantine these days? What's happening? Well, uh, I'm doing okay, I think. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, I got back, I bought a Nintendo Switch, and I've been trying to kind of get back into the video game. Okay. Um, but I got to tell you, it's kind of like when an athlete comes out of retirement, like, you can embarrass yourself on there. Like, you, <laughs> I got off, I got off way too early. Like, you can't get out of PlayStation 1 and come back in at Nintendo <laughs> Switch. I don't recommend it. Like, there's some kids online that will let you know that you're washed up. You know, it's kind of like when Jordan, like if Jordan came back now. Oh my God. You know, like I was the man. It, you, <laughs> I, you fuck with me on Madden 99, it's it's on. But like, if you don't, you get me on there now, it's, I really don't know what's going on. So have you and Tina Let's, competed in any uh, video games or anything like that? I downloaded like a golf game. Uh, and we, we play that a little bit. We're trying to do stuff together. Yeah, I'm sure you're going through mm -hmm. the same thing. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. She's been getting into that Animal Crossing. That's not my bag, but she <laughs> likes it. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. So I pay sixty dollars for a video game for me to pretend like I have a job while I'm furloughed. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I understand me. though. Anything to pass the time, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I that's the kind of thing that we've been going. That's why we're doing all these live virtual streams. So thank you for anybody that's tuning in. Uh, Rafe, you have quite a resume. I know that right now we're we stuck in here. Like, I was like, Rafe, I need a bio. And then I was like, never mind. I just went to your website and picked my favorite paragraph and posted it. So that's thank you. That's how you got it. I was, I yes. was going to email it to you, and then I saw the thing. So sorry if oh. I didn't do that. Oh my gosh, no, you were great. Um, let's talk about, you know, we've been quarantined. Ted, Ted oh my God, you do have head Drews. What is, uh, what's one thing <sighs> you're looking forward to <laughs> once quarantine is done? Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, obviously, <laughs> as a comic, I would say stage time. Like, I'm starting to feel a little bit of rust, I think. Mm -hmm. Um. It's interesting to me because so I, I look at how different people are handling the quarantine. And um, it doesn't, I feel like I've handled it pretty well. And I think it's a mixture of being a comic that's on the road. Because mm -hmm. you're usually alone, <laughs> like <laughs> usually alone all day, <laughs> writing in a notepad, going for a walk, not really talking to people, just observing them from afar. Like, yeah. So it doesn't feel as and that, and I think probably from being a drunk, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of self-isolating, so chaos and disorder sure. were, are, were like a self-imposed part of my life. So it's like, mm -hmm. to me, I feel like, oh yeah, I know what this is. 
Just hang in Oh, there. so you're like, I'm familiar with this. So Yeah, I mean, I like, mean it's double-edged sword yeah, probably, probably. But yeah, there's some familiarity that I've deal with. So I would say just getting back on stage probably. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. It is, it's a, that's a good metaphor you used as a double-edged sword because, I mean, you know me, Rafe. I'm very social. I love talking to people. I like being around and being in a community. But, like, yeah. there are times where you're totally right, like, where you're like, oh, I've, I've been isolated before. I've done this. I've observed people from afar. <laughs> being a theater major, you do a lot of observations on people all the time. Right. But uh, what uh, what's actually kind of helped me is, so before, obviously, I... Um, before all of this happened, I unfortunately missed your big premiere of your album. Very exciting mm. stuff. So what uh, what was actually kind of sweet was I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to connect more with the St. Louis community, see what I can do with my podcast now that we have to go virtual. And so the other day when I messaged you and asked you to come on, I had listened to it. And not because you're sitting right in front of me, but it really just like made me feel so good. I loved the energy that I heard in the room. You know, Tina and Bobby were a part of it, who are great staples in this community. And so that's right. why I was like, we got to talk about this. We have to do things. And I mean, I obviously am familiar with your material, but what I loved about it was there was some stuff that I hadn't even heard before, which was kind of cool. Uh, so let's talk okay. about this process. What, how, I mean, you know, you've been, how did we get from your third grade essay about being a comedian when you were getting older to now right. like your third grade self, you've got a comedy album. How do you feel about this? Like that's such an accomplishment, Rafe. Like it is. Congratulations. I took my time. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my third time grade well self spent. would be like, hey, you waited a while. Uh, <laughs> didn't know it was going to be a 30 year run up to your uh first comedy album but yeah it, it was cool I love it, it. it was cool it was fun uh yeah there's probably some stuff on there people haven't heard i blew the dust off a couple old joints that mm -hmm. i hadn't really been doing on stage for a long time and kind of yeah took about six months and brought them back and stuff i knew was good but that like you know how when you're a comic you kind of as you build the new act stuff falls away Mm -hmm. And so there was some stuff that I'm like, this is this was good, and this is something I would probably put on the record. There's a couple on there that, in hindsight, you'll never get over this as a comic. But like in hindsight, like I have stuff now that I'm like, yeah, I would have swapped that out. I would have yeah. taken that off and put this on, you know. But it's like overall, I was really happy with it. I thought the, the company did a good job. I'm glad I did it in St. Louis. Um, that meant a lot to me to do my first one here because you never know mm -hmm. what the, you know, we live in a world where you have to like purge to the coast to have a comedy <laughs> career. So right. it meant a lot to like do it here. It was good to have Bobby and Tina open for me. You know, those are my, my co comedy life mates. Everybody's got them. So, mm -hmm. and they yeah. set, they set me up for success, which was really awesome. It was really cool. Oh my God. Well, I mean, of course, Bobby J. Cox, Tina D. Ball, very talented comedians. Uh, what I'll yeah. ask you, what was the favorite part of your process into doing that? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Rafe has an album. It's called Young Grandpa. It's on basically every streaming service. You should get mm -hmm. it. Not because Rafe is sitting here. It's hysterical. I. Uh, it's What's always funny too, Rafe, is that I listen to that and you talk about one of your things you're like, oh, I'm never mistaken for like a pediatrician i'm always mistaken for like a blue collar worker and yeah. uh, I, <laughs> I was laughing because i totally did the same thing when i first met you i was like oh wow he looks super strong like he must be in like security or something and then you went on stage and you started doing comedy and i was like man he and he's also funny like this is this is <laughs> fantastic but uh, i got a text oh sorry go ahead no go ahead you go ahead no, um, I got a text from a coworker of mine and she was like, I think I recognize him from, I don't know if you used to work a bar somewhere in Illinois at some point in your life. And she was like, I was a bar oh, okay. in Edwardsville. Okay. Yeah. Well, apparently you made her a few drinks in her day. Now she's married with a baby, but literally like, uh, she goes, I know who he is. I said, Oh, well, he's a famous comedian now. Find him on iTunes, Pandora, all of that. So you yeah. actually got recognized for your blue collar work. So congratulations. <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah. It's so funny because I literally just right before I called into this podcast, I was recording a commercial. Like, it's weird because we're making, like, a commercial and we have to do it from home because you can't have a crew. So they just dropped yeah. a bunch of film stuff off at the house and me and Tina are, like, trying to, like, <laughs> cobble together some. 
and the script was blue collar guy. <laughs> Literally, the script just said blue collar guy talking about his court case. And it's oh like, my god, really? I didn't even have to audition. Yeah, I didn't even have they just said, they're like, this is just do it. We trust you. Um, so there's <laughs> times, hilarious. there's times it works in my favor for sure. And I've had that happen a lot because I wear like a black, I pretty much just wear like I'm like a fat Steve Jobs, you know, like I just, uh, I gave up on anything striped or colored as the weight went on over the years. So now it's just like, I don't, uh, there's too many decisions to make in a day. So it's like, I have my closet looks like a serial killer. I have like 18 black <laughs> V-necks and the same five pairs of Levi's 514 straight leg pants all hung in a row. It's like Homer Simpson's closet, oh <laughs> but because I wear it all the time, every I've been in so many comedy clubs where I'm like waiting to go on stage. I'll be in the back of the room, like trying to get my head right, you know, before I go on stage and people will be like, Hey man, can I bring my drinks in here? Or, uh, and I'm like, I don't know, man, ask somebody who's like, Oh, you work here. Right. So like <laughs> I'm constantly mistaken for security in the back of the room. So, <laughs> and then people will see me after the show and be like, Oh yeah, sorry, man. We definitely thought you were like, just, it actually happened to me when I met Tom Segura. Shut up! I did really? a weekend. It was hilarious. I did a weekend with Mark Norman, and mm -hmm. Tom was doing a show at the Pageant. So we did our shows at Helium, and we went to the Pageant. And I was excited because I'm like, I'm going to get to meet Tom Segura. This is dope. And gotcha. my friend Josh Potter is his opener. And we went backstage at the Pageant. And we went in the green room talking to Tom, and we're all. Uh, I made him laugh a couple times. And I was like, you know, like you put that in your heart as a comic. You're like, yeah, I know what I, I know what's up. And then somewhere in the conversation, he's like, uh, I never really introduced me. He knew my name. And he's like, hello. And the conversation came and he's like, so what's up, man? You like, are you like the door guy at Helium or what? And I was like, uh, and he goes, you're funny. And I was just like, no, I'm not. I'm a comedian, man. And he goes, oh, that makes sense. He goes, I thought you were pretty funny for a door guy. And I was just like. Even comedians don't recognize that I'm a comic. They're always just, they just assume I'm there on some sort of security detail. Oh my God. Well, it's kind of funny though. You know, in LA, a lot of times there's people that work as door people and then they, sh I was just there and we yeah. went to the comedy store and we saw Mark Marin and um, Anthony Jeselnik. And one That's of the cool. guys oh, who was actually, sorry. oh yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> Welcome to this virtual world, Zoom call, Google Hangout, whatever, it just moves up and down. But yeah, there was like a guy that we saw working the door and then he went up on stage in the main room and he was like, he was fantastic. Yeah. And so like, you know, don't, I mean, I think it's just a, like a, like we're in the Midwest, so we're just like, wait, what? But yeah. I, what I <laughs> just, it's just a different, it's a different vibe, but I think it's a, uh, I, I do, rec I mean, not, I mean, I will say I recognized you a lot when I first started doing, I've only been doing comedy for three years, obviously, but I, that's how I recognized you all the time was because I was <laughs> like, oh, there's Rafe, black shirt, jeans, all of that. Sure. So, <laughs> but it was, a uh, you, you've been such a great influence on Monday nights at the improv shop with Bobby. It's one of my favorite things to do when I'm not working from three to 11. Um, let's kind of talk about like your growth. You know, a lot of people that listen to this podcast either watch comedy locally or want to learn about what it's all about. So why don't we talk about your history? How did you, I mean, I know a lot of podcasts go, how did you get into comedy? But what's kind of yeah. your long story, short story into getting into where you are today? Well, what are we looking for? Do you want to talk about like when I the or like when I realized I wanted to do it, or like the actual? Yeah, I'd when love I to know. Well, I remember oh, wow. I was a so short version. I was a I was pretty, I was a poor kid growing up. We didn't have cable or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, and this was like pre internet. You know, I'm in the Oregon Trail generation where we I know life before the internet, but totally also adopted it. Which is weird because I feel like a an older brother and a younger brother all at the same time. Like depending on who I'm talking to, uh, I'm just like a man. How do you feel talking to me? Do you feel like an older brother or a younger brother? <laughs> no, just like maybe an older brother, but we're in high school at the same time. So it's like we, yes. it, you know what I mean? Like you're like a freshman and I'm a senior, so I'm like looking out for you, but I don't have to really explain how the world works to you. Exactly. That right. That it's was really of, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's really like, strange to, uh, it, it is weird. It's, I feel like sometimes I'm just like, I'm really stuck in the middle where I'm like, yeah, just 
figure out the internet. And then other people are like, if I don't have the internet, I'll fucking die. And I'm like, no, you won't <laughs> die from it. You really won't die. Like, go outside and go to the man who I'm talking to. I'm like, get over yourself. Um, <laughs> but I was poor, and I remember going to my friend Chris Manning's house, and he had HBO. Oh, wow. That's when you knew. Yeah. You had oh, HBO. Totally. I mean, he lived in a trailer, but he had HBO because his family had their priorities straight. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I remember... <laughs> Uh, man, it was like mid late eighties probably. And mm-hmm. Dice Clay was huge. And I remember like watching Dice Clay special when I was young enough that I knew I was hearing stuff I should be hearing and you get kind of excited about that. And I was like, Oh man, that's really cool. And then everybody kind of fell asleep. And then later that night they started playing. They, and I enjoyed Dice Clay for like the naughtiness of it for a kid. Mm-hmm. But then George Carlin's, uh, what am I doing in New Jersey? Or I think I might even been the one before that where he's wearing, it was yeah. before he was, it was before he was ponytail Carlin with all black, like jamming in New York. It was like when he was kind of making that transition from like mainstream, uh, Al, you know, the hippy dippy weatherman and all that sure. Al sleep into like mm-hmm. really starting to say something. Yeah, and I remember yeah, yeah. being—I remember being a kid and not even knowing the concepts, like not being able to follow all the concepts because I was like nine. But I remember mm-hmm. being like, "Oh, this is something." I knew that it was better. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I didn't yes, know I totally how I knew, but I knew that I'd watched Dice earlier and I liked what he did. But what I was watching now was—I felt like he was talking to me. Totally, and it felt I like it meant something to you. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I wanted to like wake everyone up at the party and be like, this guy's talking to me right now. And then it was like, after right. that, I became like obsessed with George Carlin and Richard Pryor and like started buying like comedy al- like vinyl albums and like listening to them at home and stuff like that. So that was kind of when I knew I want to do this and I think I can do this. And then... um. I guess the, to answer the other part of the question of like when it actually happened, it was a long time. Yes. I think there's a lot of pressures in your life to like be what other people want you to be. So and coming from a poor area, there's not a lot of options. It wasn't like yeah. there were no, I didn't grow up near, I grew up two and a half hours away. There were no open mics. Like I remember asking my English slash drama teacher who drama just meant we did, we had, we had the set for little shop of horrors and Greece, yeah. and we would alternate years and do those two plays for 25 years. It sounds because about right, the, yep. Yeah, the budget <laughs> for the drama department at my high school was the, approximately the cost of a king-size Butterfinger. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I remember asking her, I'm like, hey, I want to be on Saturday Night Live, and I want to be a stand-up comic. Um, how do I do that? And I just remember her face being like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> free internet. Like you couldn't look it up. There was no, I couldn't like Google how to be a stand up comic. So it was like, I just didn't know. So I like, I guess I'll go to college. Well, then I got, then I had a kid. So I kind of went to the military and then, you know, life throws yeah. you some curveballs. And then I found my way back to, um, then I kind of got drunk for like my, all my 20s. And mm-hmm. kind of fell into like a real bad, all the tropes of like a comedian without the comedy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did all these horrible, I made bad decisions. Um, and then I had a really good friend, like right when I was getting sober, tell me like, uh, which was hard to hear at the time. You get mad at people when they say stuff, you know, it's like one of those things like he was like, I think you could be the funniest guy in the world, but you're going to settle to be the funniest guy in the bar. And that makes yeah. me really sad for you. And I was like, fuck you, dude. You don't know me, dude. I'm fucking bullshit, man. I'm out of here. And then I was like, uh, of course, in hindsight, I'm like, oh, that was a real friend who was being blunt and honest with me that, like, said the thing that I needed to hear. And then I kind of just sobered up and started uh, doing everything. And I, then I had stage fright. Oh, really? Because I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, because I didn't know if I could do it sober. I had leaned on the bottle so long Um, for confidence. It became like an issue. 
So gotcha. I did just immersion therapy. I started doing Toastmasters and I started doing improv while I was mm-hmm. doing stand up. And it was like, I'm just going to get on stage until it feels normal. Gotcha. And it worked. It took a while, but it worked. Yeah, I can tell. Like, that's it. When you say you had stage fright, it's very hard for me to believe because you do look, and I know you're going to be like, well, you know, I worked on it for a while and I had to like master it and whatnot, but you do look sure. very, very comfortable on stage. I never, there's never, you and Tina both, I never see like you guys ever uncomfortable. So if you're, you're doing great, which is awesome. Yes. Um, but I, I don't really well, get it like, anymore. What? I, <laughs> what? Sorry, I don't what get it anymore. Like, oh, I don't I gotcha. get stage fright as much. Like, I get, the proper amount of like excitement nerves, but I don't get like the the shakes and the sweats and the wanting to throw up oh, on God, my no. shoes. Oh God. Yeah, no, absolutely. I trust me being in theater. I totally get it. And even though I, I wasn't from a small town, obviously, but um, I definitely didn't come from a background of performers by any means. So it actually, that kind of hit home for me when you were saying like, Oh, you know, I, I went to go talk to this teacher and how do I did this. And they go, I don't know. And, you know, not that it's the same equivalent, but being in school and being around people who didn't really understand your artistic endeavors. And I was like, oh, you know, I think I may want to produce a play or something. And my teacher was like, oh, and I was in the third I was in the third grade (laughs) and they were like, oh, you know, but my uh, my big debut was I was Mrs. Peterson, the art teacher and a play called The yeah. Artful Dodgers. Oh yeah, it was, let me yeah, tell you, it was it was like my parents, they moment. were so proud. Oh, it was a big moment and this was pre-internet too. So they brought like one of those old school um, disposable cameras that you threw out and whatnot. And I had a, like a little bow on the side and I remember taking it on VHS, I took it very seriously. And I was like, I'm gonna, and I had my own like solo and everything. And I still look back on that. I'm like, oh my God, that was the the early stages. But I too didn't start producing things until mm-hmm. my like mid, early to mid twenties, I produced my first play, but it took a minute. And it's like, you know, those curveballs kind of, I mean, those curveballs, you kind of threw a few in your album like you did. And I, I kind of did the same thing with my plays where I was probably in relationships I shouldn't have been in. I drank a little too much more than I should have. And then I had a friend that was like, listen, you're Molly Ambergy and you're not the Molly Ambergy that I remember or I know. And it was, uh, it's a hard thing to hear because you're like, you know, you don't like, are you like, you know, you feel very attacked. You feel like very personal, but then, yeah, you're like, what do you mean? I'm the same person. But then eventually you grow from that and then, you know, when you're Rafe Williams, all of a sudden you have a sold off show at the improv shop and you're like, hi, I'm a young grandpa. Come find me. So, yeah, right. <laughs> and it's but, weird. There's uh, like a there's a transitional right. period too. like mm-hmm. I was never like saying Kenny Rogers, the gambler in first grade at the talent show. That was like my oh, big. Was that the video that you shared on yeah, Facebook? That was yeah, like a okay. big that was my first time on stage where I felt I was good, like because yeah. I think when you're a kid, no one's taught you to be ashamed of the things you love yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When you're a young yeah. kid, you're just like, yeah, I like this thing. And I don't, no one's made you apologize for being yourself yet. And that's later in life. Right. Where we start yes. to get beat down. So there's like a, there's a nice little incubation period of childhood. I remember I was, I was in fourth grade. I really wanted to play a character called Freddie Fast Talk in the fourth grade play. And he okay. was Frosty the Snowman's Hollywood agent. Shut up. What? And another kid got the part, and I was crushed. And I was just like, oh, man. I guess mm-hmm. that's it. I guess I'm never going to go to Hollywood. And then the <laughs> following year, I was cast in the lead in a, a play called Winter Wouldn't Wait. Okay. And I played, yeah. I played a character called Butch Bear, who was a young bear who liked to rap and sing hip-hop songs. Uh <laughs> Oh, about what? how and refused to hibernate for the winter because he just wanted to party. Shut up. Uh, I've since tried to look this play up online. and Yeah, I what is this to, play? I wanted to do it as an adult at the improv okay. shop. I wanted to just do my fifth grade play as adults mm-hmm. and, yes. impro- and do some improvisation in the middle. But I still remember mm-hmm. like the rap was like, uh, I never went through any baby stage. I was a genius at an early age. My mom said the first words I spoke were, bring me a pizza and a Diet Coke. 
<laughs> I just remember like bringing the house down and I'm like, yeah, this is what's up. And then, oh my uh, God. so it was there at a young age and then all through high school. And then I think when you get to be an adult, people start trying to be like, well, you need, you're an adult. You have to do this. You have to do that. And they kind of, I think it's, it's easy to get steered away from the arts in yeah. like your young adulthood because people think it's not practical, especially in a place where practicality is all you're surrounded by. Mm-hmm. You know, I got a lot of really funny friends that work at the steel mill or yeah. our bricklayers because that's the only options that they, that they saw for themselves or, and they probably, and it's noble work. They probably wanted to do it. Their dad did it of and course. stuff like that. But it's like, that's just kind of, I think that happens a lot. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh, it totally does. I mean, my, my older sister is a pharmacist and it took her like, not that she was never supportive or never came to things, but everybody, I'm sure you feel the same way. And anybody that'll be watching this will understand is that, you know, a lot of times when you're saying that I'm a comedian, there are people who are like, oh, wow. Like I have a lot of people when they're like, how do you do it? Like, I would be so scared to be on stage. And then there are other people that are like, oh, well, that's really hard. Like that's, that's difficult. And I always quote Ray Williams. I go, well, it's the best job in the world, but it's the hardest job in the world too. And you have to get, Rafe, you actually helped me with the trivia question. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> I'm terrible at trivia. And right. there was a, for Jimmy's birthday, I took him to Tom's Bar and Grill in the Central West End. And uh, we there was a round where the one of the questions was, there's a quote that people say, and it says, you have to put how many hours in to, be good at something. And you always at the improv shop talk about 10,000 hours you put in. And so we got a free picture because of that, which was great. Nice. So thanks, Rafe. You got me a free picture of beer. Like, this is great. But uh, you, about, I feel- Talk about a quote ahead. defeating its own purpose. <laughs> right though, right. You put 10,000 hours in. Here, get drunk on this pitcher of beer and waste the next eight hours of your life. Oh my, seriously. I also That's won the right. theater yeah. round too. It's all right. It was a good, I, uh, I actually really don't drink a lot of beer, but it was kind of cool that I won and got a round of applause. Yeah, so I'll I'm take sure that, you know, out. Oh, don't worry. He definitely did. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what I'll ask you is, you know, what, where was like, have you ever had like a point in time where maybe you've thought to you, yourself, like, I'm comfortable in where I'm at. And now like, maybe I want to push myself out of my comfort zone. I know a lot of people talk about that as comedians. Have you ever had a time in your career where maybe you felt that way and you kind of either produced something or tried something else or with improv? I know it's kind of a vague question, but. Yeah, I think that there is, I think I might be there now where there's, there's going to be some stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I want to do creatively. The quarantine's actually helped. I'm about 35 pages into the pilot for like young grandpa. Cause that's what a lot of people want to see from me is like, well, we want to see the 30 minute sitcom or dramedy or whatever it's going to be about your life, which is like, so that's something that I've been working. I've I put it off and put it off and put it off because it's a daunting task. It's a lot different. You know, I write a lot of sketch, but getting into like more long form stuff, writing mm-hmm. a script or maybe a feature. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, I was talking to Greg Warren too about like, mm-hmm. and he was just kind of like, he's like, man, I think you should do, he's like, maybe as a separate thing, like try to do like a, a storytelling, like one person. He's like, you're, you're good at that. Like not a lot of comics are good at that. And he's like, like take yeah. an hour and tell like four stories mm-hmm. and like put it together kind of, and have it all thematically link up kind of the way. Mike, I love Mike that Birbiglia. idea. Yeah. yeah kind of like I love him. Like, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Greg's been encouraging me to maybe give that a try. And he's like, I think that, <laughs> It might be something like unique that'll help you stand out, you know, so we'll see. I agree. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not dying of Corona here, just dying of choking on yeah. my coffee. <laughs> but uh, what I'll ask you to is now you're here in St. Louis. And what I love about that with your album is that you did the show here in St. Louis. You paid tribute. There was an article I think you did with KMOV or KMOX, and they were saying how 
you wanted to do your show here in St. Louis because St. Louis made you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the community of St. Louis and how you've kind of grown and you've helped kind of people be immersed in their community as well? Sure. Um, I think that I really do, and this isn't lip service for the scene or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've been to a lot of cities now and I've seen other scenes. Yeah. Seen other scenes. Yeah, that's right. Um, and we have a really strong comedy scene here. And I think mm -hmm. that like when I go to other cities and I'm like, how many clubs do you have? You know, and I'm like, we have four comedy clubs. You know, we have Helium, Funny Bone, Laugh Lounge, and the Improv Shop. And with the success of, like, Flyover and stuff like that, like, there's cities larger than us that only have one club. Yeah. Uh, so there's an audience here. There's people here that will – I think the thing here – because I've gone to L.A. and I've done the shows in L.A. And I've gone to New York and I've done the shows in New York. And I get that that's where industry is. But those shows are brutal because people don't come out like mm -hmm. it's all industry it's all the other comics sitting in the room who don't give a shit about what you're doing on stage because everyone's got the same goal you have yeah and we're taught that there's this uh limited pie with only so many slices and if somebody else gets a slice that lowers your chances of getting a slice which isn't true like there's infinite pie just bake more pie make opportunities for yourself be a good person collaborate with people you think are talented and especially now we live in a world with like 3000 streaming platforms and Quibi just came out and it's not like we're all fighting for the same CBS sitcom, you know, like it's 1981, but that, that mentality is still left over, but you don't really have that here because people aren't thinking about that here. So all people here are trying to do is get better at comedy. Exactly. Which is what everyone should be doing. But a lot of times I think people put the wagon before the horse and move to LA with one year under their belt and think that they're going to yeah. like, and, and there's an exception to every rule. There's people that, I know. but for the most part, I think people want the fame more than they want to be good at their craft. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think the Midwest sensibility here uh, keeps people from, keeps people humble and it keeps people working. Yeah. And people come out. People like comedy here. And St. Louis is like, it's definitely made me in terms of like, I developed here. I found my voice here. I found an audience here. I managed to build a pretty successful career from here. And I couldn't be more grateful right now, especially because it's like, imagine, and I feel for them. I know a couple of people that just moved to New York and LA that just made the move. And I'm like, they're just $3,000 a month of their savings is just getting sucked out of their bank account right now. And they're getting no stage time. Like at least here I'm in quarantine, but I'm like, I can afford, and that's part of it too. Like St. Louis is a pretty affordable city for, mm -hmm. and like I've been able to be a full-time comic for a few years, which gives me more time to write during the day, more time to go out and hit mics at night or hit stages at night. And I'm, and I'm very, I'm aware and grateful that I do get a little bit of not special treatment, but you get to a certain point where like you can drop in and go on stage. Well, you've earned it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's definitely been earned, but I, I also mm -hmm. am aware that that I remember what that felt like as a young comic too, to be like, the fuck, why does he get to do 15 <laughs> minutes? But it's like, well, cause he's paid his dues or she's paid her dues and she gets to go up there and do that because one, she'll entertain the audience that we have here. Yes. For to keep them here to watch your four minutes that you're going to struggle through because you've been doing comedy for two minutes of your life. Mm -hmm. So I think people have to be understanding of that. But I, uh, this city, it, you know, I think I said in the article, like I wanted this album to be kind of a love letter to St. Louis. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't, you don't know where you're going to end up. If I could stay here and shoot a show, which that may happen, or, you know, I, I shot a pilot here for, uh, yeah. A semi scripted show. So there are opportunities where you're at. Like technology has made that a thing. So like you can love the city you're in and and I love St. Louis. So that was a long answer, but that's it. No, that was perfect. That actually answered my question. Uh you did bring up streaming services and technology too. Are you mm -hmm. able to talk about the one that you did when you were was it Nashville? Am I correct? Or yeah. it was yeah, the, yeah, the circle? 
it's out. Yeah, where can we find that? Tell us a little bit about that. That's a good question. Um, so it, <laughs> it's a brand new channel that the Ryman, uh, the Ryman Theater in Nashville partnered with this great television mm -hmm. to create a new network called the Circle Network, which is country music lifestyle, apparently. Okay. And I guess making shows for a while. Like they own the rights to the show Nashville, and they own uh -huh. the rights to a couple other. Um, like drama shows that are on like CBS and gotcha. NBC. So they're going to, they're doing original programming. They're bringing back the show Hee Haw. Do you remember Hee Haw? Uh, no, what is this? Oh man. See, this is where I feel like <laughs> an older brother now. <laughs> Hee Haw he was, was a really kitschy, uh, like family oriented kind of a variety show that was hosted um, by Roy Clark and Buck Owen and back in the 80s. Right it was now. on for a long time. It was President George Bush's favorite show. Oh, uh, well, but it was then. a lot of like down home country humor sitting on hay bales and telling like what was perceived as like clean, wholesome jokes. Oh, um, okay. So this, I see it now with the big mouth in it with the, there you go. That's it. the dude. All right. So okay. The station launched in January and it's on it's kind of random it's on some cable networks and not others on some sometimes it's on antenna tv mm -hmm. but starting in may there'll be a streaming service just like okay you can add the channel on roku and then it'll be a little more accessible so uh, next month I gotcha. you're looking for circle tv they did a great job it was the same company that did all the live at gotham oh okay mm -hmm. so they were pros that was really cool they had like and I think it was a good, it was my first television appearance. And I think that was a good, not low stakes, but it wasn't the Tonight Show. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was like, I gotcha. It was a good experience for me to get to what that felt like to do comedy with the lights turned all the way up and cameras hitting me from four different angles and a boom sweeping down in front of you. And like, uh -huh. it definitely changes like, because, you know, that's, there's a special recipe in the room when you have the dark and the audience and, the, and like, it messes with the recipe a little bit. So you have to be able to, like, adapt. And you also I also had to hit a certain mark at a certain time. And those are stuff you don't have to think about when you're doing a club. So I think it was a good – it was a really good experience, and the people were really nice. So I hope I get to do it again. Oh, my God. Well, and I, what I appreciate about you is that you are very humble about these things. Like, I, you know, you're humble about this album. You're very humble. Like, I can tell that you actually genuinely care about the craft and what you're doing, which is exactly what you were talking about earlier, about how people in St. Louis are concerned about just getting good at it and doing it. Yeah. Um, for anybody who's kind of watching this and seeing your accomplishments, and they're, you know, interested in either trying it out or keep pursuing it. Um, I know, especially in quarantine, we're all kind of in our in our crossroads where maybe, you know, at least for me personally, Rafe, I'm, I'm putting my different priorities in check while I'm during right. this time. Um, what is some advice that you can give to people that are interested in maybe pursuing comedy or uh, wanting to make it a priority in their lives the way you have? Um, get on stage. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. Uh, Cause I can't tell you how I had notebooks full of stuff, working up the courage to do my first open mic or, and your stuff probably sucks and it's okay that it sucks. That's how you get better is you, I think I say this in my, so it's redundant for you, but like we have the only art form where the, uh, the public is your editor and they edit you in real time. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you don't have the benefit. I don't get to send Molly my jokes and have Molly be like, this one's going to get a big laugh. This one's going to get a big laugh. She can have her opinion, but you won't find out until you're up in front of a room full of people. And you have to make failure a vitamin, like make it something that you can swallow and it gives you nourishment and it makes you better and you don't take it personally and be able to go home, uh, get on stage and edit off stage. That's my advice for new comics is go on stage, record what you're doing, go home and listen to it. Like you can't avoid failing in comedy. It's impossible. Not if you want to get better, but you can minimize the amount of times you have to fail on stage by the amount of work you're willing to do off stage. So it's like, if you just go do your five minutes and then you wait a week and go do that same five minutes and you make no adjustments and you don't listen to your set, listen to where you're getting a laugh and then be like, okay, 
there's a laugh I can build around and then listen to where you're a lot of times the problem is you're not saying it the way you wrote it because you're nervous or you missed a critical piece of information so the audience didn't understand what you were saying. And sometimes it's just not good. Sometimes it's just a beginner's joke and that's okay. So that's my advice to newcomers that I always give people at the mic is like, get on stage as much as you can because that's how you get better. And also stay in the room and watch other comics. Don't be selfish and only worried about your five minutes. Like if you're at a two and a half hour mic, it's that 10,000 hour thing we talked about. You can, mm-hmm. you can either log five minutes of your 10,000 hours because you're only worried about your five, or you can log two and a half hours and you'll watch really good comics do stuff and you'll be like, oh, I see what they did there. I see how they crafted that joke and the structure. And you'll see comics make mistakes that you can avoid. And be like, oh, I see what he did there. He tried to punch down. He tried to, he's being misogynistic and the crowd hates it or whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then you can save yourself a lot of pain and, and agony when you write and you be like, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that transsexual joke I wrote because it's in poor taste or whatever. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and you can save yourself the embarrassment of having to do that if you pay attention to other people's failures too. Um, so that's, that's my advice for newcomers is three pronged approach. Get on stage, stay in the room, watch everybody edit when you get home. And for people like us who are already in the craft, not that any of you are watching it right now, but (laughs) if you were, here's what I would tell you. I was talking to Bobby about it on the phone the other day, because I think a lot of people are feeling like anxiety and stress and like, I don't know about you, but like, I've been productive. I haven't been as productive as I would like to be. Like to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Considering that I've got pretty much 24 hours a day at my disposal, but it's hard I think a lot of people are saying that they're writing, but they're not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. It's like the people that are always posting how hard they're grinding, but then I'm like, why are you doing the same five minutes for five years then? If you're grinding yeah. so hard, how come I haven't seen any new jokes? Hashtag so, grind. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. hashtag grind. So people like to grind <laughs> more than they grind. like. Yeah. <laughs> right. People like the hashtags more than they like the notebooks. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so my advice for working comics and I was talking to Bobby, and I'm like, right now, it's like, no one's an island, but it's like you're stuck on an island right now. It's like castaway, right? And it's like, what? Mm. You can either sit on the beach and feel sorry for yourself, or you can try to build a raft. Now, yeah. I don't know if your raft will float. You may get out in the ocean, and it breaks into a million pieces. But if you at least try to build a raft, And the raft here, for those of you that aren't following, is a metaphor for whatever you've always wanted to do, whether it's maybe something like, do you have a stand-up bit that you think might be a good sketch? Try to adapt it into a sketch. If you've always wanted to write a 30-minute pilot, sit down and start writing. There's free software you can download and just write a shitty first draft. You don't have to show it to anybody. Just Mm -hmm. write it. If there's a project that you've always wanted to get off the ground, if you think... An improv scene you did might make a good sketch. Write a sketch. If you think a sketch you wrote might make a good stand-up bit, try to re try to rewrite it and adapt it into a stand-up format. So I everyone has those. Like you asked me that question earlier of like, you know, what's your next I think challenge yourself, right? What's yeah. something you've always wanted to do. So challenge I would say to people like challenge yourself, put together a Saturday Night Live writing packet, even if you don't send it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you have questions about that and you happen to be one of the comics that's watching this private message me, I'll be, I have samples I can show you and I'll send you like materials and links to stuff like that. So, there's always like writing fellowships. Cause like, that's a good way to get your foot in the door as a comic is become a writer. Cause that's what we do. What is that? We should be doing is writing anyway. So, um, Back to the raft metaphor, it was like, eventually there are people that you trust that are, you're going to be your rescuers, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the, like your fellow comedians, or maybe I have a writing partner that's not a comedian, which I like. He keeps me grounded okay. in reality. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, find someone you trust and someone you respect and bounce stuff off. You're eventually going to run into people again. Mm-hmm. So you can come out of the other side of this with some, with a handful of stuff and be like, I don't know if any of this is good, but I... I didn't sit on the beach. I like I walked around and I foraged and I found this fruit and a coconut. I don't know how to open this coconut, but I got a coconut. 
And uh, I put that on the raft. I found this old volleyball. I painted a face on it. And it's like, will everything that you do yield results? Probably not. But you'll feel better if you come out of the other side of this and you actually have some kind of body of work to be like, you know what? I'm rusty as hell, but I'm going to go on stage and I got seven pages of new shit I want to try. And I wrote this sketch and maybe I can make a video sketch out of it. And so I would say, long story short on that, branch out, build the raft, and then don't worry about it. What's going? You're eventually going to be able to take it out on the ocean and see if it floats. Absolutely. That's And that's one thing I really appreciate about you, Rafe, is that you are very good with metaphors. You've had a few that I've also, there was one about kind of taking a, a part of gun and putting it together. Um, yeah. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, so I'm not going to no. say it, but you are very good about that. And, you know, why I wanted to have you on, not because you're sitting here right in front of me on virtual land, is I, I do respect you. I know that you work hard at what you do. I can't say that enough. And what I do like, that was like one of my goals this year was to start doing improv. Obviously, we're under quarantine right now, so we are not at the improv shop. But yeah. what I love, I was like, so that that is still a goal. It just had to be uh, put on hiatus yeah. for the time being. Well, because being sure. in theater, you know, and doing stand up, a lot of it is exactly what you said, like writing, figuring things out, seeing how things sound. It's just like when I do theater and I write a play, before I even produce it, I have to have a table reading. Sometimes we're in rehearsal and things, it's just, you know, sounds a certain way when somebody else says it versus when another actor says it. Uh, but with improv, what I love about it is a lot of it is uh, unscripted. And I loved volunteering for Flyover Festival this year because I got to go see Dad Van. And I had talked to Libby oh. Higgins, yeah, beforehand. And she goes, oh, you're going to love them. They were on this podcast. She goes, I know they're like sitting at a table, but this is extremely hard to do. And I was so happy I chose that decision because I couldn't stop laughing. And uh, what I wanted to say is how, how did you get into improv? And then is there a certain, I don't know too much about it. I've only had a few improv artists on it. I know there's a lot of long form and short form. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into that and anybody that's interested in improv, what you think we should know? Yeah, I think that, so I got into improv. I started when I got back into stand up. I was kind of part of the immersion there. I, I literally was Googling like if I could find like a stand up class mm -hmm. because I was just like, because no one tells you, I write a joke, right? We guard all this shit, which I've never understood. I'm like, share that knowledge with people. But it was like, it was kind of like a guarded thing. And I'm like, I want to be a comic. How do you write a joke? What's the difference between a bit and a chunk? You know, like what's, so I was like, maybe I can find a class where somebody will like, just teach me the lingo. And so I don't look like an asshole. Yeah. And just help me figure out if I'm structuring my joke. Like I had all these pages, but I'm like, a lot of times it's just you're writing in paragraph form because that's what you've been taught your whole life. And it's not, mm -hmm. the structure's not there yet. So I Googled and the only thing I could find, I saw the improv shop and like I had read Truth and Comedy from like Del Close, this book in college and thinking it was a stand up book and it was about improv and like being like, this book is fucking weird. I don't get it. <laughs> Wasted my eight bucks at the student bookstore. But then I was like, all right, I'll sign up. Like, it's comedy. It's comedy in the title. That's all I needed to know. And then I got there and I quickly realized it was something very different. Like, it was, you know, the two are related, you know, but it's not, they're not the same thing. Like, you're the captain of the own ship and stand up. It's all about you and improv. It's all about everyone around you and making everybody else look good. Um, so I got into it and then I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I took to it pretty well. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. And then it's a lot of state and that's a lot of that 10,000 hour stuff. Like you rehearse two hours a, a week and then you do shit, 30 minute shows. And the other cool thing with the stage fright with improv was like, it takes the onus off of you to be funny the whole time. Yes. Like you're working, you, you kind of succeed and fail as a team, mm -hmm. which makes it a little easier to swallow the failures and the successes still feel good. And uh, it kind of preps you for stand up, which I think is a little more harsh. It's like, 
Improv is your like soccer mom that tells you you do a good job, even if you kick it in the wrong goal, because you you, know, you kicked it hard, honey. You kicked it real hard. <laughs> And it went in, and you made the shot, and those boys, yeah, the other team won, but they all got trophies because of you, and that's nice. And it's like, stand up is like your drunk hockey dad, you know, that's like, <laughs> ah, Jesus Christ, I got to call off work for three days. You embarrass me out there, you know, and it's like, I like that. I like, I think you need both. I think you need both mm-hmm. worlds. You need like the yin and the yang of it. Uh, but I will say, I know there's like a ri- like this will probably only resonate to like people in the biz, but like there's always this like rift of certain stand ups that are like improv sucks. I would never do improv. I hate it. And I'm like, that's just because they can't do it. It's like, <laughs> to be honest with you, you don't want those people taking improv anyway because there'll be assholes on stage that like want to hog the spotlight. Mm-hmm. But I will say improv lends itself to stand up a lot. Stand up yeah. does not always lend itself to improv for the reason I just stated, which is like, yeah. you got to let go of control a little bit. You have to be able to collaborate with other people. Um, so if you're a really selfish, self-centered person, which a lot of those types of personalities are drawn to stand up in all honesty, uh, you'll struggle in improv because you it won't be fun. You'll kill a scene because you're trying too hard to be the funny one. Right. Uh, but I think improv teaches you to play comedic characters and it teaches you to be able to come up with stuff that's funny on the spot, which has been invaluable to me in stand up. When it whether it's like doing an act out or like having to handle a heckler or do or just riffing off of something on stage, I think that skill set for me is much sharper because I took improv classes as opposed to just, you know staying in the stand-up lane. Now, this quarantine Absolutely. has exposed some people for that. I've seen some strictly stand-up comedians that are very famous that never took an improv class, never wrote a sketch, and they're trying to do them online. And really? Okay. Good. Oh, yeah, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> I've seen a few where I'm just like, hey, you should have taken an improv class. Like, you're very stiff. Oh my because god! Because it's something they're not used watching, to doing. Guys. <laughs> yeah, That's but know. see, they're, they're, these they're are watching. Are so famous, <laughs> they don't give a shit. <laughs> well, you're our famous person, so that's why I was excited. Yeah. I was like, we got to get St. Louis's Gilf, which I'll lead into. Lastly, here, you do have this right. comedy album. Let's talk about. It is called Young Grandpa, and you are the famous Gilf of St. Louis here. Let's talk about the title, mm-hmm. the meaning of King it, Gilf. what it means to you. Talk to us about this. About what, Young Grandpa? Yes. Yeah, so I became a a dad when I was really young, and I was a grandpa at 36 years old. That's a true thing. I have a granddaughter who's very sweet. And um, I think there was, like, you asked me a question earlier about, like, uh, like a transitional period. Or, like, when did you, like, get out of your comfort zone for a long time? For the first few years I did comedy, I didn't want to talk about my personal life okay i tried to be i was a little more generic you know what i mean like sure. it was a little yeah. more like like surface kind of just yeah i think when people say yeah. find your voice all they mean is like are you talking about something that you are uniquely qualified to talk about sure. and are you are you coming from a place of truth in your life as opposed to like you know there are there's a there's a place for every type of comedian but like if something's like a twitter joke that I'm like, I could give this joke to you and you could put it on Twitter and it, there's nothing personal to it. Uh, I think I was doing those kinds of jokes and then I finally got comfortable and started talking about being a grandpa and stay, like about my personal life. And then once I started writing about that, I feel like I, I just feel like I leveled up as a comic and like got over a hurdle. And then I realized, oh, this is, much easier to just tell the instead of trying to find something funny or manufacture something funny, just like if funny's laying around the house everywhere, just like talk about it, talk about be vulnerable. And that's the thing improv helped with is like be vulnerable, talk about stuff that like you know, you're talk about your your failures as much as you boast about your successes. And I think that that became so that became a big chunk of the material was just talking about being a grandpa and like what's that, what that's like and um, 
so it made sense to me for that to be, you know, the the title track in the first album. Yeah. It's uh, I love the album art for it too. I could uh, Jim Keith the dad is on it as well. Jim so. the dad Keith, baby. I had to really <laughs> rein him in a photo shoot. Oh my god, I bet. Well, I was about to say, who are all those? Are they all grandpas that are around you, and you're in the middle of that album art? Yeah. So when we did the album art, a guy named Adam Huber here in town, who's super talented, really great artist here in town. I can tell. Mm -hmm. I I hit him up, and I was like, here's the concept. I think it's funny, like the juxtaposition of making like an action movie poster or like a heist movie poster. But my crew, mm -hmm. because I'm a young grandpa, my crew's all just like old dudes. <laughs> and uh, he's like, yeah, we'll put you in like a flying V formation. You know, like you're and I so I wanted to make like a movie poster. Yeah. With like explosions everywhere and like an Apache helicopter in the background. And he made it all happen. And like so I got Jim. And then some of them were uh, Gary Ship, who was, uh, he does improv. Okay. And it's like his daughter does improv and she got him into it. So I, I recruited him. And then a couple oh, other were just so people's grand A couple other guys were just people's grandpas that they're like, my grandpa would love this. Uh, and they showed up. I didn't dress them up. That's how mm -hmm. they showed up. I, they, Shut, I so wait, that was just how they showed up. You didn't even. How they like, showed up. I that couldn't is have crazy. asked for a better casting call. Rafe, that is fantastic. I didn't even realize that. I thought like I, I'm, I'm like I was envisioning like directing and making them, but that wow. Oh. oh, good for you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> we showed up, and I was like, we don't need to go into any kind of. Uh, they brought like a change of clothes, and I'm like, you all are, are per you all came dressed perfectly. Uh, mm -hmm. I had to like limit the amount of props I allowed Jim, the dad, Keith to use. I go, Jimmy, get, he had like a back brace and a cane and a. I was about big, to ask, did he bring anything with him in a bag? Things, and I think he had one of those hats with a <laughs> propeller on it that spins. And I was like, all right, Jim, you get one prop. One. Oh my God. And he did he have any cane. good one liners when he showed up? Yeah, he had plenty to say for sure. <laughs> Well, I have, I'd like, if I could show you the file of all the unusable pictures where I was like, Jim, you don't have to mug for the camera. You're already old. Just look old. <laughs> Just look like yourself. And then he'd be like, <laughs> and I'm like, Jim, stop doing that. And he's like, like, okay, I'll stop. Man. And he's like. Yeah, I'm like, exactly. I'm going to stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. He's a natural born like performer. He, he is just, you know, when I saw that on there, I laughed my ass off because he is just, the other time I saw him, Ray, he had like two flags sticking out the back from his back. Sure. And it was that he just, I was like, this is, this is just Jim, the dad, Keith. And he was like, which prop is your favorite? And I was like, I love all of them. I don't know. I don't know what to tell yeah, he you. he gets into so. it, man. But he's great. I love Jim. Yes. I wanted, it, was, oh, it felt good me. to include him in it. He was excited about it. And um, so that was nice. That was yeah. a nice oh, I love him to death. Thing. He's a good person. Love, I mean, obviously dating a gym, love the gym. Jim the dad, Jim the boyfriend. Gym that's fan. all the. Uh, I, I really am. You know what's so weird, Rafe? So my sister, who, so I was like the younger sibling born later in life, and all of my siblings are in like their 40s and 50s or whatever. And one of them, my brother-in-law is also named Jim. So a very like interesting situation so anytime we're all together nikki and i'll be like jim and the two of them are like what and they just turned around and i'm like oh uh -huh. this is a this is interesting so have, somebody's gonna have to accept the nickname i think yeah like james or i don't know or jimbo some people call jimmy that too i just go jim but uh, what I will ask you to, where can we, where is the best place or anywhere that we can find? I found your album on Spotify, but where, what's easiest for you, man? <laughs> where can we Honestly, listen to it during whatever. quarantine? Like, whatever, just whatever you like. If you like, mm -hmm. it's on Spotify, it's on Pandora. Some people, apparently Pandora is still big for comedy. I didn't yeah. know that anyone listened to it anymore, but apparently like they're the number one streaming for comedy. It's on Apple music it's on if you want to you can go to amazon and buy it it's on amazon music it's on uh, uh itunes if you still use that mm -hmm. uh it's on napster and that's not a joke it's on napster so if you're if you wow. still aren't on napster or limewire get it get in there and get I've, it 
LimeWire. Um, that can, just threw me places back. You can buy it. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Google Play. And I think you can buy it on, hell, I don't know, something else. Maybe iTunes. But, like, it's up to you. If you want to buy it, buy it. If you want to stream it, stream it. Um, the best way you can help me is if you stream it, just make, like, an artist playlist. Mm-hmm. That would help me out because then I go on other artist playlists and then that just it gets my comedy out there to people, which is the point oh. of the album to begin with is like 100%. share it. If you like it, share it, tell people about it and feel free. If you like it and you want to drop me a line, drop me a line. I always like to hear people and, like, and you know if they enjoyed it. If you don't like it, you can still contact me, but I'd prefer you didn't just don't like it in private. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've gotten some good reviews. Like I said, I, I have Spotify premium, so I just use that. But I went on iTunes. I saw people are liking it there. Um, I have actually, like I said, I have a few friends who, like my phone was blowing up last night because people were like, you know Rafe Williams? Why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, I don't know. I just see Rafe is Rafe. Like I have yeah. So I was like, you know, which is, and There's I mean no that thrill. as a compliment to you. I'm like, no yeah. thrill. I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, it's just, it's, you know, my friend Rafe Williams. Like it's yeah. not, you know, it's Rafe as that one. I just will never forget, last story here, there was a, one of the first improv open mics I ever did. You were going to go up, and this guy, I haven't seen him since, but he was like, bring up Rafi, Rafi, Re, and he couldn't even say it, and he's just like, yep, this is a, this is somebody that read the list. It's fine. Never yeah, saw that, that guy again, lot. but. <laughs> it's understandable. It's, um, I also I need know. to figure out a joke where I say my name, because. I have it happen at shows a lot where like I'll get off stage and I'll see people after the show, like leaving helium or wherever. And they'll be like, you're funny, man. I'm going to follow you on Instagram, Greg <laughs> William. And I'm like, it's not Greg. It's not it's Greg. Not Greg. <laughs> I'm like, I'm never gonna find There's like some guy named Greg Williams. It's like, and I get, oh, there is. I get a lot of followers on Friday and Saturday nights. I can't figure out why. <laughs> so, uh, I was going to say, like, Rafe probably works in your favor, though. It sounds like a Hollywood name to me, like Rafe. I get Amberg butchered all the time, so yeah, the usual. <laughs> Rafe works in my favor if people know it. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. The problem is when they try to look me up or something after a show, and they think it's Greg or Ray, or and then they're like, ah, I guess he's, he must suck. He doesn't even have a website. So I might remember a joke for my name. That's very industry hack, but you know what? You got to do what you got to do. You know what? I have a comedy album now, so there we go. Uh, Ray, where can we find you on social media, speaking of, before we head Uh, out of here? At I am Rafe Williams on pretty much everything. Uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I haven't, I I got rid of Snapchat. I haven't gone on TikTok yet. Uh, So that's Twitter, Instagram, or type in my name, R-A-F-E. Williams mm-hmm. on Facebook. My comedy page is I am Rafe Williams, or you can still try to friend me on my personal page. Whatever you're into. Whatever you're into. All right. Well, Rafe, thank you so much. I mean, on a thank personal you. note, always great seeing you. Remember, you everybody that's watching, uh, thank you for watching the live stream. We'll also get the video, put it on YouTube, all of that. And then just remember, get your mug, casually not giving a shit. All right. Bye, Rafe. Thanks. Ted Drew. <laughs> Ted Drew.